called Becoming Nothing, Becoming Everything. It's about a topic that many people consider impossibly hard to accept. Yet the teachings surrounding this topic seem to be at the very heart of the contemplative quest to represent the core teachings of the world's high mystics, of those who claim intimate knowledge of the highest good. I want to open with a statement by a great Tibetan Buddhist master, Kalu Rinpoche. We live in illusion and the appearance of things. There is a reality. We are that reality. When you realize this, you see that you are nothing. And being nothing, you are everything. That is all. This is echoed tersely by St. John of the Cross. He said, To arrive at being all, desire to be nothing. To come to be what you are not, you must go in a way in which you are not. Or even more simply, as another Buddhist teacher put it, big self, big problem. <laughs> no self, no problem. <laughs> It's easy to say that these people are simply speaking in metaphor or hyperbole, but they mean something far more radical than we are at first willing to admit. There's two parts to this talk, and I'm going to get back to that profound topic in the second part. But I want to start with talking about some of the ways that we try very hard to be something, something big or important. Uh, the ways that we work at creating that big self that's a big problem. Christians call it pride. Buddhists have many names for these ways to be self-important. Psychologist Gordon Allport told the story of little Tommy taken for the first time to church by his mother. When he saw the cross on top of the steeple, he cried out, Look, Mommy, a tea for Tommy. Allport said Tommy has a long way to go to realize that the cross stands for crossing out the I rather than enhancing it. While our own ego-centeredness is usually not so gross as that of a young child, that it is deeply entrenched, there can be no doubt. In the list of the Buddhist kilesas, the defilements are the torments of the mind, Sixteen major problem mind states are cataloged. No fewer than 13 of these have some direct connection with pride or may easily manifest in a form related to pride. This is the power of delusion in Buddhist understanding. Delusion makes us see things wrongly, makes us have things out of kilter. A major thing we have out of kilter is our understanding of what we call ourselves. We're going to look at some of the subtleties of pride as the Buddhist teachings have delineated them. John of the Cross has given examples of these different mind states, and he calls them variously by names such as pride, vanity, vainglory, self-complacency, and similar terms. So we will illustrate the Buddhist classification with examples from St. John's teachings. St. John, of course, does not speak of the grosser manifestation of these errors, but of the ways they appear in spiritually minded people. Greed, called lobha in the Pali language, the language of the Buddhist scriptures, is one of the root or major defilements. One important area of greed can be the desire for honor, fame, praise, reputation, being seen as good or important, and so on. Of spiritual beginners who don't know themselves very well, St. John of the Cross said, they love to receive praise, and sometimes they even seek it. They search for a spiritual guide who will congratulate them and be impressed by their deeds. In other people, a deeper problem exists. He says, some want praise for their works, others thanks. 
They want others to talk about them and are pleased if this person or that or even the whole world knows about them. St. John reminds us, God is more pleased by one work, however small, done secretly without desire that it be known, than a thousand done with desire that others know of them. Two of the types of pride of which Buddhists speak represent an unwillingness to bend or to defer to others. One of these, called tamba, is variously translated obstinacy, impertinence, refusal to show respect, obduracy, unwillingness to accept guidance or advice, or lack of respect for objects and persons worthy of respect. Overvaluing our own good behavior can lead to this attitude, according to St. John. He says, one becomes more incapable of taking counsel and receiving reasonable instructions about the works one ought to do insofar as one does not quell vain joy in one's moral deeds. St. John warns about this. One who wants to stand alone without the support of a guide will be like the tree that stands alone in a field without a proprietor. No matter how much the tree bears, passers-by will pick the fruit before it ripens. In contrast, he says, a humble person cannot be completely satisfied without human counsel and direction. These souls humbly and tranquilly long to be taught by anyone who might be a help to them. A companion attitude can be even more dangerous. This is maka, ingratitude, depreciation of others and the gifts they have given to one are of the worth of the gifts. This negative reaction to another's help can go to the point of detraction or contempt. We humans have an amazing capacity at times to turn on those who help us, and wounded vanity that another should be our superior can be behind it. St. John, interestingly, doesn't have much to say about ingratitude, but he speaks a lot about gratitude, describing the appropriate response to goodness. Buddhists consider a grateful heart one of, of a list of things they call great good fortune. In one place, St. John describes proper gratitude for God's gifts by referring to one who wants to love God as purely and perfectly as God loves her in order to repay God by such love. And in one very poetic outpouring of gratitude, he says, You have wounded me in order to cure me, O divine hand, and you have put to death in me what made me lifeless. You granted this with the liberality of your generous grace. Another set of wrong attitudes is centered around taking satisfaction in ourselves. Mata is a kind of intoxication with oneself, our vanity because of such givens in life as youth, health, beauty, intelligence, or even virtue. We can get heady about our own assets. Psychologist Eric Fromm called such a state malignant narcissism. He said it's based more on what one is, through little or no merit of one's own, than on what one does. St. John, speaking of natural gifts like beauty and intelligence, says that a person is vain and deceitful if one rejoices in these gifts only because oneself or one's relatives have them. And referring to those who make much of spiritual experiences that come to them, he says, there usually remains in the spirit a certain hidden satisfaction and an esteem for oneself. Without one realizing it, an abundant spiritual pride will be bred. And about exercising gifts or talents that we have, St. John says that taking joy in one's works ordinarily falls into vainglory or some kind of vanity. Our Lord's reproval of the disciples for having rejoiced that the devils were subject to them is a demonstration of this truth. If this joy were not vain, he would not have made the reprimand. The defilement of Pamada 
seems to take this self-intoxication one step further. Here, there is overconfidence and negligence. This leads to heedlessness, carelessness, indolence, remissness, and lack of proper consideration. St. John usually calls this attitude presumption or complacency and says, These beginners feel so fervent and diligent in their spiritual exercises and undertakings that a certain kind of secret pride is generated in them which begets a complacency with themselves and their accomplishments. Tepidity of spirit is the outcome of joy in one's natural goods. St. John says further that some become audacious with God and lose holy fear. Illusions and deceptions so multiply in some, and they become so inveterate in them that it is very doubtful whether they will return to the pure road of virtue and authentic spirituality. Our next pair of torments of the mind are based on concern with the image of oneself that others have. The first Maya refers to attempts to hide faults and pose as innocent. There can even be hypocrisy, deceit, and deception in doing this, from St. John. They confess their sins in the most favorable light so as to appear better than they actually are, and thus they approach the confessional to excuse themselves rather than accuse themselves. They minimize their faults. The defilement of saramba refers to wanting to shine, to showing off and ostentation, being a superstar in others' eyes. Buddhists say that when this is strong, we may even resort to wrongdoing or put other people in danger in order to display ourselves. Ostentation fosters attitudes of rivalry and presumption. And St. John warns how overvaluing one's works can lead some people to such boasting. He says, Drawn by vanity and arrogance, they will allow themselves to be seen in exterior acts of apparent holiness, such as raptures and other exhibitions. Elsewhere, he says, sometimes they want others to recognize their spirit and devotion, and as a result, occasionally contrive to make some manifestations of it. They are eager for others to take notice of these. The next pair of torments are based on comparing oneself with others. Mana, which is often translated as conceit, is specifically defined as this comparing attitude. It does not matter whether the comparison is favorable to oneself or the other person. The comparing itself is mana, our conceit. Psychologist William James, who can turn many a pithy phrase, spoke of some religious people who go about with the greatest of pride, seeking out an audience to whom they can proclaim their worthlessness. <laughs> Whenever we feel either worthless or uniquely valuable, you can bet that some comparisons are being made. St. John understands very well how this works. He says, A person cannot fasten the eyes of esteem upon one object without withdrawing them from others. If we focus over much on our own goodness, our neighbor looks the worse, and vice versa. And speaking of people who have little self-knowledge, St. John says, they are more pleased with their own spirit and spiritual goods than with those of their neighbor. John offers counsel on avoiding this comparing attitude, saying that we should not meddle in other affairs, desiring not to notice their good or bad qualities or their conduct. The defilement of Atimana seems to take mana, or conceit, one logical step farther. This attitude is one of arrogance, haughtiness, superiority feeling, even to the point of scorn of others. It's holding an exaggerated opinion of self, which leads to looking down on others. In talking of contempt for others, St. John refers to those who boast, I am not like so-and-so, nor do I do anything similar. 
He says this happens when a person judges others, comparatively speaking, to be evil and imperfect, supposing that their deeds and works are not as good as one's own. About those who take this kind of excessive delight in their own spiritual experiences, St. John says, they become self-satisfied to the extent of thinking that they are very close to God and that others who are without these experiences are very far from God. And like the Pharisee, they look down on these others. In their hearts they condemn others who do not seem to have the kind of devotion they would like them to have. St. John says that this attitude must be healed in the dark night, for there we will know only our own misery and keep it so much in sight that we will have no opportunity to watch anybody else's conduct. <laughs> Next are two even more malignant attitudes which are based on comparison. Issa, our envy, is also separately classified in the Christian list of seven capital sins. Envy is sadness at what another has that one does not oneself possess. St. John said that you can recognize those of such wrong spirit from the affliction they experience upon thinking or being told that others receive the same favors or even better ones than they receive. He goes on, many feel sad about the spiritual good of others and experience sensible grief in noticing that their neighbor is ahead of them, and they will not want to hear others praised. To learn of the virtues of others makes them sad. Some become angry and envious in noticing that others receive praise or accomplish more or have greater value than themselves. Carrying envy one step further is macharia, or miserliness. One can be miserly about many kinds of goods, as in wanting to keep from others good qualities or assets that one has oneself, such as beauty, wealth, or intelligence. One can be possessive about having the attention of others, and can even be reluctant to share what will help others grow spiritually, wanting to keep spiritual goods from others. From St. John. Some become so evil-minded that they do not want anyone except themselves to appear holy, and they condemn and detract others whenever the condition arises. Encouraging the opposite spirit, John says of more advanced people, these souls would give their life's blood to anyone who serves God, and they will do whatever they can to help others serve God. One final pair of attitudes related to pride focuses on considering oneself higher than one really is, or making pretensions to spiritual attainment that one does not have. This is seen as a very serious flaw by Buddhists. We have certainly seen in America how people who make untrue pretensions to spiritual advancement have even hurt others who look to them for help. Making such pretensions is one of the five major sins that a Buddhist renunciate can commit along with such things as murder, splitting the spiritual community apart, or harming a holy person. It's taken very seriously. The first of this pair, palasa, is the desire to consider oneself on a par with those higher than oneself, morally, intellectually, or spiritually. One may try to make it look like they have more attainment than they do. This desire can mislead one seriously. St. John says, for example, some intellects are so lively and subtle that while recollected in meditation, they reason naturally and easily about some concepts and think these are from God. Many are deluded by it into thinking that theirs is the enjoyment of a high degree of prayer in communion with God. It serves for little more than inducing vainglory. Such tendencies of our mind are one good reason why we need the help of a spiritual guide when we seriously want to grow spiritually. A competent guide can recognize subtle tendencies to palasa and nip them in the bud before we are seriously deluding ourselves. The second of this pair, satya, goes further. 
Here one makes frank pretensions to qualifications one does not have and may use these claims for personal advantage. This is an attitude Buddhists recognize as capable of creating much suffering. This boastful pretension may even include fraud or treachery. In a relatively mild case of this, St. John of the Cross was asked to evaluate a nun of whom others were making much. He discerned this attitude in her and said, It seems she has the desire to persuade others that her experiences are good and manifold. A person with a genuine spirit does not desire to do this. St. John points out that some people, in their desire to appear holy, enjoy relating their good behavior to their confessor and in such careful terms that these good deeds appear greater than they actually are. So we have looked at 13 distinct and separate ways in which the spirit of pride, the desire to be something, can operate in us. In a passage that is often unfortunately translated as encouraging people to hold themselves in contempt, St. John tells us not to overprize ourselves, not to make too big a deal out of ourselves. If we want to nip in the bud the root cause of all other disordered appetites, this overburdened self-sense is that rich person who finds it harder to enter the kingdom of heaven than it is for a camel to go through the eye of a needle. Trying to combat such self-enhancing attitudes as we have just described is about renouncing self-preoccupation. And renunciation is a giving up that typically occurs with some pain. What St. John and the Buddha, along with all the world's great mystics, want us to do is something even more radical. They want us to relinquish the self-sense, simply to let go of it. Once done, the effects are much more far-reaching than any hard asceticism at curbing self-exaltation to which we might bend ourselves. The philosopher Sartre said, hell is other people. The teachings we are about to look at would say that Sartre, go wrong, is close to right. Hell is seeing other people as other. Hell is seeing oneself as some thing separate and distinct from everyone and everything else. As we move into looking at the teachings of the Buddha and St. John of the Cross on self, let us reread what Kalu Rinpoche said with a slightly different emphasis. We live in illusion and the appearance of things. There is a reality. We are that reality. When you realize this, you will see that you are no thing. And being no thing, you are everything. That is all. Since we Westerners tend to be psychologically minded, let us start with what American psychologist Carl Rogers said about the self. His definition of the self is difficult. I'll unpack it. He defines self as the organized, consistent, conceptual gestalt composed of perceptions of the characteristics of the I or me and the perceptions of the relationships of the I or me to others and to various aspects of life. It is a fluid and changing gestalt, a process, but at any given moment, it is a specific entity. So let's unpack this. Self is a bunch of perceptions or ideas that I have about what I call 
I are me. This collection of ideas that I have that I, about what I call I or me is constantly changing. It's fluid because it's a process. What I call I or me is not a thing. It's a process. If, however, we look at these ideas that make up I or me in any given instant of time, the way we look at them is to see them describing an entity or a thing. But then it changes. Because in reality, it's constantly changing. What I considered the thing or entity that I was a second ago has now become different. Rogers even went so far as to say that the whole self-sense is just a bunch of hypotheses that we make in order to meet life. According to Rogers, then, the self is a collection of concepts or ideas about some constantly changing processes that are going on. We call them I or me, and we see them as if they were some solid, unchanging thing. But this thing never stays constant. Now, these incessant changes are typically very hard to see outside of deep meditation practice. What generally happens is we immediately leap to the concept or the idea of I, and when we're looking at our concept, we see the processes that we call I as if it was some lasting, unchanging thing. The Buddha said, whenever we make concepts about anything, including ourself, we're doing this. We're taking something that is fluid and changing. By making a concept, we freeze it or solidify it. We have experiences. Some of these experiences seem to be like experiences that happened before. So we form an idea or concept about them, and then we call these experiences that thing. Forming a concept congeals the experience, makes it look solid and lasting and permanent. An example. If I say tree, that makes my experience of light and color and shape and shadow and movement, when I'm seeing what I call tree, it makes all those experiences into some fixed and unchanging thing. Because the concept tree, the idea tree, has that static, unmoving quality. But we know it's not true. What I call tree is never exactly the same from instant to instant. It's always changing. Similarly, what we call sea is the constantly shifting movement of drops of waters or chemicals bound together, which are themselves, as I say, physical chemical processes. Waves, which look like individual things, appear in this sea process. They swell, they grow, and then they die, crashing on the shore, and they're sucked back under into this larger body. They're only temporary processes within the larger process that we call sea. Similarly, what we call a symphony is a succession of sounds, notes of music, each one rising, lingering, dying. Where is the thing you call a symphony? Mm -hmm.